The popular podcast, Masters of Scale, just dropped a new interview with AI leader Mustafa Suleiman that we think is well worth paying attention to. So Masters of Scale is a podcast primarily hosted by Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, a former OpenAI board member, current Microsoft board member. He is also with Mustafa, the co-founder of the AI company Inflection. So Mustafa is the former co-founder and CEO of that company. That company basically got aqua hired by Microsoft. Now, Mustafa is the CEO of Microsoft AI, which means he's not only on the bleeding edge of AI development, he's also a key player in both Microsoft's AI strategy and something we'll talk about a little bit more this episode, the company's relationship with OpenAI. Mustafa is a key player in governing how that works. So, Paul, you kind of found some things that jumped out here in this episode that were worth noting. Can you walk us through them? Yeah, so I, I do think it's worth listening to. And as you mentioned, in the context of Solomon's role with Microsoft, it is uh, very instructive of where they're going. Um, and so as one of the key players, it's, it's definitely worth paying attention to. So I'm going to highlight a few of the key points, but one he talked about up front is recursive self-improvement, because the key thing with this interview is he was kind of time stamping these key elements and when he thought they might be occurring. So recursive self-improvement is basically the ability for the models to, to identify their own weaknesses and flaws and hallucinations and fix themselves. This sounds awesome on the surface. It also sounds terrifying because this is one of the things that the, the doomer side worries about is these things develop the ability to recursively self-improve, which could enable like a fast takeoff where they just become really, really smart, really, really fast when they can fix themselves basically and find these flaws. So he said, he sees that coming into view in 2025, that teams will start experimenting with that. We have heard about this from I think Claude, uh, they've talked a little bit about it. I think we heard a little bit about this with O1 um, preview from OpenAI. As you develop the ability to do reasoning and chain of thought, part of that process is to identify when the chain of thought breaks, when it's no longer true, when like a falsehood has been found or misinformation is found within it, to be able to go back and fix that. And so that is something to watch. It is. Um, you know, we talk a lot about that Andres Karpathy intro to LOM's YouTube video from January, 2024, recursive self-improvement is one of the things he got into. Um, one of the other things I was not surprised to hear them talk about was EQ versus IQ. So intelligence you know, versus, you know, emotional quotient versus, um, intelligence quotient and, or emotional intelligence. And the key here is this is what he was trying to build an inflection. That's why I wasn't yeah. surprised at all. And they're, that they're bringing that to Microsoft. So. IQ is what these models are really good at. It's often how they measure them is their cognitive abilities, intellectual potential, um, logic, problem solving, math skills, analytical skills, reasoning, language comprehension. Those are all the natural things, but emotional intelligence is more the ability to recognize, understand, manage, and influence one's own emotions and those of others, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, social skills not what you would traditionally expect from an AI. And so in his case, he said, it turns out that actually tone style, emotional intelligence of these models, um, the extent to which they will ask you questions, the extent to which it reflects back on the type of language that you might use and so on, that delivery vehicle for the substance is perhaps more important to the majority of consumers than just an objective regurgitation of Wikipedia, he said. He went on to say, I think that's going to be one of the key capabilities. I think everyone's starting to wrestle with that now, um, as we look at this agentic future is how, what is the personality of these models and, yeah. and, and the good and bad. I mean, we talked about, you know, the, the challenges of when these things become too human-like when they have a high emotional intelligence, that if that is not properly protected or contained, then you have humans developing unhealthy deep relationships with AIs that seem very human-like. So this is a very slippery slope. I mean, right now we've just talked about emotional intelligence and recursive self-improvement. Now Mustafa talks about these things as inevitabilities and like that they're actively looking to build this in. Now keep in mind, Microsoft may do both of those things more ethically than others will, or more ethically than maybe an open source model would allow third parties to build. 
He got into AI agents. He said, um, the first step for the agentic future is that your co-pilot has to, uh, have the ability to see this becomes extremely important. We've talked multiple times, about uh, Microsoft's efforts with this, we have project Astro from Gemini, OpenAI is working on this. They want these things to be able to see the screens, Claude, we, you know, computer use we talked about. So he says the AI companion has to be able to see. Uh, uh, and having an aide or an assistant or a companion that is really seeing the pixels that you see on the screen in your browser, your desktop, your phone means there's a new level of sort of awareness about your sensory input that enables the companion to observe what you're seeing and be able to do things. Now, ironically, last week, Microsoft's co-pilot Twitter account tweeted, if only your browser could see what I see, oh wait, co-pilot vision will be able to very soon. So this is aligned with what Microsoft is saying they're going to do. Um, so that was an important one. Memory was another one. We've talked a lot about memory being one of the next key unlocks. So memory is the ability to go from conversation to conversation and inflection or chat GPT or Microsoft Copilot and have the AI remember everything and be able to personalize everything it's done based on your history. Now, OpenAI has been working on this. They've talked a lot about memory. But he said, we're going to nail memory. I mean, I'm really confident 2025 memory is done. Permanent memory. Yeah. If you think about it, we already have memory on the web. Copilot has really good citations. It's updated about 15 minutes ago. Knows what happened in the news on the web, so on. And we're just compressing that to do it for your personal knowledge graph. When you add in your own documents, emails, calendars, stuff like that, memory is going to completely transform experiences. Uh, because it's frustrating to have a meaningful conversation with like a Gemini chat GPT inflection and then go on an interesting exploration around some creative idea and then come back three or four or five sessions later and you have to start again. Like it doesn't remember anything. So memory is a really key thing. He also talked about models, said the good news is the models are getting bigger and smaller, which we've talked many times on this show about that they're going in both directions. But he does think that the biggest models have a lot of room to go, that there's plenty more data that they can infuse in these things. They're not going to see a slowdown in the frontier models for at least the next few years. And so the frontier models are going to kind of have an outsized impact, but the smaller models are going to be critical to the future. Um, I like the example he, he used here, which we shared before, like why small models make sense. He said, small is definitely going to be the future because if you think about it, the very large model, when you ask a query of these frontier models, it's lighting up the neural representations of billions of pathways, which are not relevant to the query at that hand. It's like, if someone asks me something and my entire brain fires to, to answer it, that's mm -hmm. not what happens in our brains. There's very small pieces of our brain tied to specific cognitive tasks. And so our brains are highly efficient because we don't use every neuron for each cognitive thing. Right now, the large language models are basically firing every neuron when you say, what was the score of the Cavs game last night? Like every neuron has kind of, and so they're trying to build these small models that allow for these things. And then I'll, I'll kind of end with his final thoughts. Um, and this sort of aligns with what we just talked about with the potential of, you know, growth and economic impact. So uh, I think that this is a moment to found companies, scale companies. It's a moment to really pivot careers. Even if you're not an entrepreneur, um, even if you're an activist or an organizer or an academic, this is the moment to really pay attention because by 2050, the train will have left the station. It'll be quite different. And this is a moment where we really do have a chance collectively to shape and influence things and nothing is predetermined. It's really, it really is within our reach to shape it for the best of humanity. And I think that's quite, um, we're very lucky to be alive at this moment. It feels incredibly empowering and it's a great responsibility. Oh, I don't agree with everything Mustafa says, and there's elements of what they're working on that I don't, I'm not that excited about, um, as a, <laughs> as a human, uh, I, I, I like his thoughts at the end and I, I kind of echo those. And I've, I've said it many times, like the, the only way we do what we do. And I think as much as I do about this is because I believe we have a possibility of an incredibly abundant future. And I, I choose to be optimistic about it, despite the concerns and fears and the uncertainty. Um, I, I don't find worrying constantly about that stuff, uh, does me any good. <laughs> and so I choose to try and take actions to ensure the greatest possible outcome for myself and my family and everybody else. And that's kind of how I keep going each day with this stuff. Yeah, I feel like we need a regular segment on how to stay 
optimistic and keep our sanity. <laughs> keep your sanity while yeah. covering this space.